I just put it in perspective. When I began my career, there were, you know, maybe four big human resource consulting companies, and that was kind of it. There were a few staffing companies, <clears throat> and they mainly provided temporary uh, services if somebody was out for vacation and that sort of stuff. It was pretty small industry, didn't have very much influence. Uh, now it uh, we outsource so much to uh, vendors of various kinds, and a lot of it about the fundamental ways the company operates, the organizations operate. And the biggest aspect of that is staffing. So, you know, in most companies now, uh, we have a large proportion of our workforce are people who are not the employees of that workforce. And I'm not talking about just outsourcing work. We're talking about work that is done in our building. And by some measures, 30% of employees in the U.S. are not employees of the location where they're working. So it's not outsourcing the work. It is outsourcing the people but keeping them in your organization. And, uh, you know, a, an example of outsourcing a function, but keeping it in your building is managed service providers. That means you basically outsourced your IT to a company like Accenture or IBM. They're in your building. They are the people, the employees are there. They just don't work for you. And that industry, just managed service providers, is $250 billion. The industry that provides employees, uh, staff rather, uh, that is $750 billion. So if you total up all the aspects of the human capital industry, it is $1.9 trillion. And it's about the same size as the Italian gross national product, at least the official Italian gross national product. The real one's probably bigger than that, right? Um, but 1.9 trillion is makes it the sixth biggest economy in the world. And that's an enormous number, right? And the fact that it is so big raises lots of interesting questions. Uh, financial accounting establishes the rules of the game for the benefit of investors. So, you know, we used to think that CEOs and business leaders had competing objectives, they had different stakeholders, et cetera. But for sure, in the last 40 years, the most important share stakeholder has been the investor community. And they are trying to assess how companies do perform, who's good or bad. Their goal is not economic efficiency. Their goal is not current profitability. They're interested in longer term shareholder value. So, you know, have a company like Amazon or um, a lot of the tech companies um, where the Tesla were not making any profits, but their share price was wildly high, right? Uh, so they're interested in future shareholder value. And there's a set of rules that govern how they decide who is valuable. And that comes from financial accounting. And these are rules that come down indirectly from the government. So in the U.S., it's the Security Exchange Commission. In the U.K., you've got the same kind of arrangement. Um, there's a board that the Security Exchange Commission delegates the creation of the rules to. In the U.S., it's the Financial Accounting Standards Board. They're not a government agency. They're not really accountable to anybody except to their own board. And they create these rules. And the rules are like the rules governing a sport, right? Uh, and, you know, you might think if you're thinking about soccer or football, uh, you're trying to describe the game to somebody and you say, well, the goal, you know, the point is to just get the ball in the goal. And somebody say, why don't you just pick it up and run with it? Right. So, well, you can't do that because that's not the rule. And then things that seem pretty obvious, you know, until you know the rules um, change a lot once you know the rules. So financial accounting has a particular problem with people, humans in that it doesn't really think they matter. Uh, and the reason for that is it was developed in an era when capital was all physical capital. These days, most companies are service companies, and the assets we know seem to be human, except for financial accounting, humans cannot be assets. And the reason for that is they believe you have to own something for it to be an asset, then that simplifies and clarifies a lot of things in traditional business, but not in services. So even if I have employees who are under contract to me, 
uh, the financial accounting would say, well, I'm sorry, they're just not any assets. You say, they're under contract, so what? You don't own them. They can't be under contract to you. And so you start thinking about things like training. We always talk about training being an investment, but not if you're financial accountants, because you can only invest in an asset. You don't own employees. They can't be assets. Training can't be an investment. Right? And a, a particularly quirky part of financial accounting reporting, this isn't in the accounting, but in the reporting of it, is that we assess performance based on a per employee basis, not a per worker basis. So if I take my current employees and get rid of them and bring in the workers from a staffing firm who are not my employees, my headcount for financial accounting has dropped enormously. And therefore, my revenue and profit per employees improved just enormously, right? Um, and one other point, I mean, that's one reason why you might want to get rid of your current employees and use leased employees. There is a view, which is not strictly in accounting, but it is widely held in the world of business and finance, that employees are a fixed cost. Fixed costs are things that if business goes down, you're stuck with them. If you have a lot of fixed costs, you could easily be wiped out if business turns down. So they really, really don't like employment costs. You know, it may have been modestly true a few generations ago that it was hard to get rid of people. It's really not now. You know, companies lay off all the time and lots of time simply to improve the investor's view of how they are performing, right? So the backdrop of, of this uh, is a lot of the outsourcing of this work uh, has gone because we would like to cut our headcount because it looks better in the investor community. So thinking about typical HR tasks, there's nothing that I can think of that has not been outsourced. But here's an example. There's uh, an arrangement in the US called Professional Employment Organizations, PEOs. And PEOs uh, can literally become the legal employer of your own employees. So uh, the people who work for me, I can turn over their employment to a PEO. Uh, originally, the idea behind this was the PEO takes on the legal liability. Like if you get sued, I'm sorry, you can't sue me. I'm not your employer, even though you're working here, you got to sue the PEO. Um, the rules have been tightened up on that. It's not quite so much of an issue there uh, with, with respect to that. But if you are the employee of a PEO working for me, I can become the co-employer. But everything about the way, I mean, and that is, I get the ability to boss you around, to supervise you. But everything about the way you're paid, about your benefits, any complaints you have, all go to the PEO, not to me, right? So that's a remarkable example, right? But when you come to hiring, um, most aspects of hiring can be outsourced now. And sometimes a lot of it is. Uh, you know, one example of this is there's lots of companies in the staffing industry who will literally hire people for you. The biggest hirer in the U.S., prob close, not, not entirely now, Walmart, Walmart as a company is certainly bigger, but is a company most people have not heard of called PeopleScout. And they were hiring about 300,000 people a year. They're hiring for their clients. Uh, and the clients then become the employer. So People Scout finds the people, interviews them, makes hiring decisions, turns them over to you. You're then their employer. Even on employee relations. So these are the legal issues like complaints. or And complaints could be things like, I believe there's sexual harassment here. Even some of that is being outsourced now to vendors. And if you think about companies talking about the importance of having our own culture, you know, culture is really important, but you're not hiring people. You're not setting the terms of conditions of employment for them. You're not dealing with their problems. You're not creating a, you know, you're not creating a culture for them, right? You're not responsible for it. You've effectively outsourced it probably to five or six different vendors. So if you have an industry of $1.9 trillion dollars, uh, and their marketing budget is typically companies like that, 20% of their revenue. Um, and so 20% of 1.9 trillion, pretty big number. Uh, and of that 20%, you know, a lot of it is sales, maybe certainly half of it is sales, but it's not all sales. A lot of it is marketing more generally. 
And the marketing is pitching to potential clients. And that means average human resource departments and sometimes their bosses. And this pitching comes in the form of a wide range of reports, studies, marketing materials, and they're driving the entire agenda inside human resource departments about what we should be doing. Virtually everything comes from these reports. And the problem is the reports are not really interested in just informing you. They're interested ultimately in selling you stuff, right? And I was once involved in one of these reports and we did the report, which started out quite sensibly, uh, surveying clients and asking what they were doing and stuff. And we had kind of helped, I'd helped draft a report, here's what it find. And then somebody from marketing came in and said, no, we're not doing that. We're going to market with this other thing here. And they just completely rewrote the report in a way that had nothing to do with the evidence in the report. It was simply to line up with their new marketing pitch. Now, having said that, what's what are examples of this? Well, um, early on, 20 years ago, uh, McKinsey came out with this notion of the war for talent, a very popular phrase which had some um, sentiment be sense, sense behind it, basically the idea that more valuable employees, better employees are super more valuable than we think, probably true. But the, the beginning of this was a claim, which was simply a misreading of the data, that the US labor force was shrinking. And uh, this was widely distributed and lots of other consulting companies pick it up and start to disseminate this. And I was, part of a meeting with one of the government agencies in Washington when they were drawing up these plans of how are we going to deal with the coming labor shortage? And I kept asking, what what are you talking about here? What evidence is there for this? The Bureau of Labor Statistics, you know, the official data gatherer and prognosticator of the U.S. labor force was said, you know, no, just labor force is not shrinking. Um, what was happening was that that a particular cohort the echo of the baby boom in the U.S. was smaller than the cohort behind them. And from that, they drew this conclusion that the workforce was shrinking. Um, they didn't notice that the group behind the echo of the baby boom was even bigger than the baby boom. They weren't paying any attention to that. And even with that in that cohort, you know, it was just the rate of growth was slowing. That's all. So it kicked off this wild waste of time in lots of organizations trying to think about how do we deal with this declining labor shortage. Um, the biggest one, which you'll all certainly have heard about, is this notion of generational differences. That was entirely created by consultants, uh, and there's no truth to it. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. did an uh, exhaustive investigation of this a couple of years ago, published a report in 2021, uh, and their conclusion was basically that there's no evidence for any generational differences. There's no millennials, there's no Gen X, there's no Gen Y, there's no Gen Q. It's all made up by consultants. And the consultants were making a simple mistake that all demographers knew. They were confusing age effects, the way people behave at different ages in their life course, with the notion of a cohort, a generation, and that is this cohort has values which are different than the one born before them and born after them. So the claim would be 22-year-olds today are different than 22-year-olds 10 years ago, basically. And they're going to be like that forever because you're going to see this effect, right? Even when you have a generational difference, it's only on average. It only means that in a graduating class of 17 million, you know, you might see on average people think this, or something like that, right? But there wasn't even any evidence for that. So it was entirely cooked up by consultants. And almost every HR statement you're going to see anywhere refers to these generational differences. And I get one of these every day from some company, you know, how to hire with Gen Z or Gen X or Gen Q, whatever it is. Entirely fake, a complete waste of time, right? Just to give you a couple of others, um, in 2017, the companies, consulting companies were rolling out these claims that AI and driverless trucks uh, were going to take over. And by 2019, you know, we're going to have to find something to do with all our unemployed truck drivers, and you better prepare for that. 
course, completely wrong. We don't have effectively any driverless trucks. We had a massive shortfall, at least at current wages, in the number of truck drivers we've got. Um, and one that I was deeply involved in is after the Great Recession, terrible job market, employers could just hint that they were hiring and they were overloaded with overqualified applicants. A couple of years into that, uh, the unemployment rate was still about 6%, but companies started to complain that there was no one to hire. And we had a, they would claim a massive skills shortage. Zero evidence for this. All that was happening was the labor market had tightened a little bit and they could no longer hire machinists at $15 an hour the way they could a few years before. And they're saying, what's going on? I, I something wrong with the labor market. It, it, the labor market just started to adjust again. That's all, right? So the problem is we waste in public policy lots of time chasing these myths which have been created by the industry. Uh, and the industry, by the way, are creating problems because they're going to offer you solutions to them, right? Uh, and this is sort of like the pharmaceutical industry, <laughs> although the pharmaceutical industry is talking about real illnesses and real cures for it, but they're trying to get you to pay attention to, are you sure you don't have this? Ask your doctor about this. Uh, but in this case, there's also no real pushback. It's not like human resources is the accounting industry that has professional standards, requirements, um, things that you have to, as a member of the accounting profession, do and pay attention to. There's none of that in human resources, right? So they're kind of defenseless against this incredible onslaught daily of claims from the vendors about, here's a problem, here's what you need to do about it. One of the reasons is in this effort to get leaner and more effective and whatever, and outsource, human resource departments are now sort of shells. Um, and when they're engaging these vendors, they no longer are asking for advice. That's used to be what happened. There were consulting companies in human resources. You ask them for advice, they tell you what to do. Those have shrunk down incredibly, despite the fact that this industry has exploded overall. What they need now is someone to do it for us because we don't have the staff to do it, right? So they don't have any internal staff who are really very expert in these things, who can push back on these claims, except for the very biggest multinational companies. You know, Some of them do, but even there, I think they're subject to these. You go to a conference, the conferences are all talking about these things, you know, um, and you're getting daily these reports. And from the big consulting companies, the strategy consulting companies, the accounting firms, you know, organizations that we think are highly credible, right? So even there, it's difficult to push. Think about the, the CEO role in a company or whoever is the president, the very top person, right? They um, are in charge ultimately of a, trying to balance things. And even if they think their whole job is to make the company more profitable, there's nothing about saying maximize profit that tells you how to do it. They have been, I think, extremely captive to the chief financial officer's orientation. And their job is not to think about what makes the business most effective. Their job is to think about how do we look to investors mainly? And they're focused on costs, right? So the CEO has to think about overall company effectiveness. Uh, and I was just reading about an account of one of the multinational companies that was being attacked now by investors because they believed that the leader had made them incredibly lean and cost effective, but but so lean that they were ineffective as a company now, right? They just were running so lean, quality was suffering, innovation was suffering, everything was bad. So the CEO has to strike that kind of balance. And I think the problem is they have not understood the enormity of the costs of managing poorly. For example, uh, we're managing poorly and our employees hate us and they quit. Well, what does that cost us? Well, if you don't know, you're gonna <laughs> you're not gonna think it matters very much. And in most companies, incredibly, they don't seem to even know. And if you think, which you sometimes hear, that the cost is four thousand dollars, that was someone's estimate of the administrative costs of bringing a new person into the company. It's not the cost of lost productivity 
when the person is gone and the cost of having to bring somebody up to speed and the costs that one person leaving increases the probability other people are going to leave. If you think it's $100,000, you're going to think quite differently about that than if you think it's $4,000, right? And right now, companies are not, for example, paying much of any attention to whether their hiring practices are giving them better employees. They're just not measuring that. It's astonishing, but they're not measuring. What are they measuring? Cost per hire. Can we drive that number down? Well, you can drive it down pretty easily and get lousy people. But that's the kind of stuff that's happening in companies. So it is basically telling us, look, could we just pay more attention to the internal accounting, not the financial accounting, which is the only thing that investors kind of see, but inside we should be able to know whether we're hiring good people, whether our practices with respect to recruiting are working, whether what we're doing in terms of management is pushing good people out the door. Here's a, a statistic that the folks at ADP, which is a vendor, um, but they have data on 80 million employees and they're producing some really interesting results. And one of their findings was that 29% of employees who were recently promoted leave within one month. Now, if you think about it, isn't that like a fire that you would think, oh my God, what are you gonna do about this? And why is it happening? Well, one of the reasons it's happening is because we have started to promote and not give them a pay increase. This is called dry promotions. And someone in the company probably thinks you could really save money. We've just promoted you. You're probably happy with that. And we'll worry about your pay later on. It's incredibly dumb, right? Because you've just, by giving them a pro promotion, moved them into a higher paid labor market. And you're not paying them appropriately with the market wage for their job and thinking they're somehow going to be cool with that. And they leave. I mean, it's unbelievably dumb, right? And you can see example after example of this, right? And why is it happening? Actually, the book I started to write, uh, you know, it's never quite the book at the end that you think you're going to write at the beginning. The book was basically just to try to describe how we actually manage as opposed to what a textbook would tell you you should do, right? And then when I started to do it, I could see in practice after practice, in training and hiring and onboarding, in thinking about benefits, every aspect of it, you can see this kind of penny wise and pound foolish approach, you know? Let's squeeze down the costs of doing it, uh, but we're not paying any attention to what the effects are afterwards. So that's the problem. 